Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for, for joining us and for coming today. Um, we have a few more folks coming in. Thanks for joining. Good afternoon. My name is Brandy Bird, and uh, Gaurav Ramakrishna is here with me. And today we're going to talk about a project, an open source project called AgStag. And before we get into what that is, you can see from the, the screen that Ag, AgRec, excuse me, not AgStag, AgRec is agriculture recommendations. And before we get into the specifics of what that means, um, I'll go into the next slide to give you a preview of what we'll talk about. Um, first, I do want to talk about the team because without our team, AgRec or AgStack for that matter wouldn't exist. Um, I'll also talk about the vision, um, what AgRec really means, and the vision, the impact that we hope AgRec to actually make in the community. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about the players. Um, we'll talk about Clemson University and their partnership, as well as partnership with the Linux Foundation and AgStack. And also, we'll talk a bit about Call for Code, which is the organization that Gaurav and I are from. And lastly, Gaurav is going to talk about the AgRec solution and some of the technical decisions and frameworks and tooling uh, that was used in AgRec and why we made those decisions. And finally, uh, Gaurav is going to take you through what our roadmap looks like ahead. All right, so the core team, um, a year ago, probably a little over a year ago now, um, none of us knew each other except for Gaurav and myself. Um, but as I said, Gaurav and I come from the Call for Code team, and I'll talk more about what Call for Code is for those who don't know. I see a couple of folks in the room with a Call for Code t-shirt on, so I know you guys know. But for those who don't, I will give you an overview of what that is. Um, I'm a software development manager, and Gaurav is our lead developer for AgRec, among other projects. And it just so happened that Gaurav has become our lead for all of our agricultural open source projects. Um, and Sumer Johal, some of you may know him, but he's the executive director for AgStack, uh, which is a consortium that came out of the Linux Foundation. And he has been instrumental because each person on this core team has been able to contribute uh, and develop AgRec through AgStack. So we certainly wouldn't have the project without Sumer. And the other two individuals, Kendall and Mallory, are from Clemson University. Um, in full disclosure, I'm a graduate of Clemson University as well. Um, but uh, Kendall, he's a precision agriculture engineer, but he's also the director of the Edisto Research Center, which is in Blackville, South Carolina. And Mallory is his program director, and they work closely together. So this is the team. Um, you can tell that Kendall and Mallory, with an agriculture background, have been instrumental. But I'll get into more details about the exact contributions that they've made. So the vision. And before we get into the vision, I do want to give you a little more personal um, background about me and why this project is special to me and why I was most interested and not just because I'm a graduate of Clemson University or because I work in Call for Code um, but growing up one of the things that I always remembered my grandfather saying and for me I grew up in South Carolina so he was always granddaddy and that's what we called him and we were really close and one of the things that he always said was never sell the goose that laid the golden egg. And for a kid, it's like, well, what does that mean, right? And it took me a while to realize that he was referring to land as the golden egg. And it was so valuable to him. Um, it was valuable to my great grandfather, my dad, and every generation I can remember growing up, everybody had a farm. And I grew up in a really small rural part of South Carolina, and everybody in the community had a farm. Um, you had to drive everywhere because nothing at that time was within walking distance. But whenever you drove, 
through town, you would see farms, you would see cows, and we had cow crossing signs. And we still have those because agriculture and farming was just so instrumental in our community and there was so much built around the land and the farm. It was family, it was community, it was growing up in these environments. So for me, growing up, these were staples uh, that I saw. And when I came to Call for Code and had an opportunity to work on open source agricultural projects that were meaningful to real farmers, you know, the same small farmers that I saw growing up in my family and in the community, it was meaningful to me. So, so this is not just a, a project. I think all open source projects are meaningful to us, but it was important to me personally to be able to participate in this one. So with that, I do want to give you a bit about what vision we had when each of us came to this project. Um, like me, growing up in a small rural town, um, there are others, and, and some of you may know about the Cooperative Extension Service. I see a couple of heads nodding. Well, where I grew up, there were these regional offices where farmers could go into the office, and if they had a problem with their farm or if they had crops that weren't growing, they could go into these regional offices and get help from these agents, cooperative extension agents, and it would be free that they could get this help. So that was a, a huge part, again, of the community. And today, rural farmers still use this service. Um, I went to vote earlier this month, and <laughs> I looked up and I saw this sign that said Clemson, Clemson Cooperative Extension Service. So it was one of those small rural uh, regional offices um, for cooperative extension. So having said that, rural farmers uh, are still using the extension service, but uh, it has evolved a bit in the 100 years that it has existed. But the problem was that rural farmers were using these books or manuals, and they would be out in their, in their fields on their tractors with these books and you know, flipping through pages and figuring out, okay, what is this disease? Is it a disease? Or why aren't my crops performing or my soybeans or peanuts performing and growing like I think that they should? So if you can imagine yourself, especially in Austin heat, <laughs> it's hot. Your, your plants are not growing and you've got a book and you're sitting on a tractor, that is not the best experience. So that was a, a real problem that we saw and we had a vision to modernize that whole experience, right? So that farmers would have access, not just in their one region, but what if we were to imagine a framework where rural farmers in the small South Carolina town where I grew up to farmers across the world in India and other places that have the same cooperative extension network, if they were able to make use of a framework where they could get recommendations and advice and information and community even from a framework where they don't have to drive into an office, they don't have to have a, a physical manual that they carry with them when they ride their tractor out into their fields. What if we had a system? What if we could build that? And by the way, what if it's open source that anybody can use this framework? So that was the vision that we had, and we just started to build and build and build on top of that. And we said, well, we've got all these extension services around the world. What if we bring them together? And every person, you, every, every extension service has some different information that they can contribute. But what if we make the framework open and all of these contributors and data providers, and even if you're not a part of an extension service, but you're a researcher and you have data that you can provide, what if we create a framework where anyone can lend that data and make it available to farmers across the world? So that's what we came up with, and we hope that's what the impact will be. All right, so I talked a, a little bit about Clemson Extension, Cle Clemson Cooperative Extension, and this is not a, a plug just for Clemson, but they're the first ones that um, contributed and the first ones that we've been working with, so we kind of use them as a model when we talk about Cooperative Extension. Um, and so this picture in the top right is an aerial view 
um, of the Edisto Research Center. So you can see they've got farm animals, they've got their uh, crop production fields, they've got um, on farming demos and research. They've just, they've got youth education. They've got all of these different resources there in one place at their research center. And in addition to that, they still have the regional offices that I mentioned. So cooperative extension, and not just for Clemson, but I'm sure this is the case for other extension services across the world, um, they focus on research, education, and outreach in the community. And that's really important for what we want to do. Let's go on to the next slide. All right. So, so that was the cooperative extension, um, their role in AgRec. Um, so they were one of our partners. The other partner in this is Call for Code. Um, and there are a couple of folks here from Call for Code. Yep, <laughs> a few people. And Call for Code is, it, it is the largest humanitarian open source effort of its kind in the entire world. And I've been at IBM for a few years and it wasn't until 2021, um, last year, that I discovered that Call for Code actually existed. Um, and it exists within IBM, but certainly is open to developers, both technical and non-technical alike. But it, it, it's like no other organization that I had ever heard of that focuses on open source solutions that make a real impact on people, real people in the world. Um, all of the other projects that I had participated in at IBM were commercial project products and projects, which is expected because that's what IBM does, but for IBM to make room and to make space for this particular open source effort that focuses on helping real people in the community, like the farmers that I mentioned and many others, I thought was just, just amazing. And the next slide shows some of these, some of the solutions that Call for Code has supported over the years, and Daniel is here. He was with Call for Code from the very beginning, back in 2018, and beside him, Charlie, he participated in the first winning solution that Call for Code sponsored through its uh, global challenge back in 2018, five years ago, um, and, and that's when it all began. Um, Charlie, his solution was called Project OWL, and it's all about providing a mesh network so that first responders and others can communicate when natural disasters happen. Um, and there's no internet, for example. We need a lot of that uh, now with climate change. Um, also, Promotato in the following year was a way to protect uh, firefighters by having predictive analytics uh, so that they could measure toxicity exposure. So. Um, harmful and toxic gases, for example, measuring their temperature, making sure that they're okay as they're going into these stressful environments. Um, and we've had other solutions over the years from Agrily last year to uh, SafeQ and our Call for Code for Racial Justice solutions, which uh, happened in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and so many others Call for Code really stepped up and, and people across the community uh, within IBM and even outside of IBM wanted to be a part of these solutions that tackled racial justice. And those solutions are still being deployed and piloted today. And finally, this year through our global challenge, which started in April, this is our fifth year. And not to make this about the global challenge, but it's our huge contest every year that makes each one of these solutions possible. Um, and it's an opportunity for developers all over the world to participate. So I think we've got a QR code at the end for those who are interested in participating. Um, you can go to Be My App, which is the platform that we're using this year for the Global Challenge. And there is a $200,000 prize for those that win if that's an incentive. Um, and finally, there's a third partner in this beyond Call for Code, and that's the Linux Foundation. 
which we obviously all know about. Um, and I'll just briefly say here that the, the Linux Foundation is the one that uh, was the reason for AgStack and why it exists. AgStack came out of the Linux Foundation. And also I'll mention here that all of the, or most of the projects that were on the previous slide, you can see listed here. Um, and they're deployed within the Linux Foundation website. So if you're interested, you can go to the Linux Foundation website and participate there. Um, I'll quickly mention AgStack, although we want to uh, work with those third-party agriculture uh, applications and developers, which we are doing, but AgStack itself is about building the stack you see in the middle. So if you look at this at like a, sta a sandwich, the meat is in the middle. Um, and so where it says frameworks, that's where most of um, the open source solutions that AgStack develops, that's where we sit. That's where AgRec sits. And um, Gaurav is gonna talk more about that. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Yeah, so AxTech is, um, you can say, call it as a repository or a space where all the, there are a couple of projects under AxTech, like user registry, pest models, uh, AL, ML data sets, uh, repositories. Uh, one of them is the AgRec project. So it's a circles around everything around uh, agriculture related projects. Uh, they wanted to create this open source space where uh, it's vendor agnostic and uh, where it's uh, friendly for everybody to utilize some of these frameworks, either on their own, your own deployment infrastructure or uh, to integrate with your existing applications. Uh, again, this is uh, to enable all the recommendations or information related to agriculture to come under one repository so that uh, globally it can be accessible and utilized. Because as we see today, there was a biggest challenge. When we look at uh, agriculture related information online, uh, you have to go to uh, respective uh, websites, uh, which are all in the form of PDFs or you know, HTML contents. Uh, and uh, you know, there's no easy way of integrating with any of uh, today's modern technologies. Uh, especially when uh, there are data intensive where you want to retrieve the data, uh, you know, you have to pull it, you have to parse through the data, uh, you know, pick up all the keywords and points that is useful and then uh, leverage into your solution. Uh, but with AxTech uh, coming up with this concept uh, where they're providing an infrastructure or space where uh, projects are designed to easily integrate with existing applications or enable uh, to run on uh, self deployment to utilize that information to help you know local communities or farmers, uh, that was the goal of AxTech, uh, and I pass it off to Brandy again. Uh, there's one slide I think. So it's yours. All right. So this slide, and I'll speak to this really quickly so that Gaurav can get to some of the uh, technical solutions that we made for AgRec. But this slide basically shows how AgRec was born from uh, contributors from AgStack, Clemson, and Call for Code. Um, and uh, I'm gonna let Gaurav talk about the APIs that are a part of AgRec and what makes it what it really is. Um, but again, this slide was just to show that this really truly was a community and collaborative effort between the three of us, but also to stress the fact that we don't want it to just be the three partners. We want more and more people to contribute. We want more ideas, um, and we want to grow the community. So um, I think Gaurav has a slide where he's going to talk about that. Okay, thank you, Brandy. So uh, we know that uh, uh, Clemson New Extension Services were storing all their recommendation informations uh, as part of their PDF files or like you know, HTML content of their website. Now for anybody to leverage that information, it could be farmers or like you know, third party agriculture based applications. Uh, there was a lot of work they had to do, either download it, you know, uh, use it as a printed files around or take their manuals of extension services offices or for applications like Agrily or Liquid Prep, which are focused around helping uh, farming communities uh, for them to leverage this recommendation information, integrating or you know, um, uh, pulling these data sets was the biggest challenge. So 
at the same time, when we uh, decided about creating this Agreg project, one of the biggest challenges, we know we wanted a database to store this recommendation information, uh, but we, we didn't know how to you know, uh, extract that right information from these files. So uh, we asked Clemson uh, team uh, to help us in extracting this important information uh, by referring say, into um, uh, some of the information shared by FAO, which is a food and agriculture organization from United Nations, uh, a couple of other agriculture-based uh, applications to understand how would the data sets look like and what are the important information that usually farmers would uh, need into day-to-day -day activity based on the experience Clemson uh, University were interacting with their farmers. So that uh, user journey experience from them helped us to create a sample data set that Clemson University actually shared with us and we decided that we'll have a database to store this information. Now to access this information, we wanted a user-friendly interface uh, that is uh, one uh, for data providers such as uh, Clemson Extension Services or any other extension services around the world to easily upload their data sets uh, you know, uh, uh, from an user interface and that data sets to be very uh, protective. Uh, this is because uh, if we allow uh, users to access these data sets to manipulate tomorrow, uh, they, they can change anything. So the goal was to create a user interface dedicated to data providers uh, such as extension services or anybody who has uh, recommendation or knowledge about farming data that they think it will uh, help uh, to upload easily and protected at the same time. Uh, and also we wanted to provision this user interface to um, scale tomorrow to enable other categories to such as pest models or uh, uh, you know, diseases information. So we initially uh, wanted to start off with just crops uh, because that is abundantly grown everywhere, but slowly we want to scale that user interface to allow data providers to add information about pests, diseases, or anything related to other recommendations in agriculture domain. Uh, the other side of user interface uh, we wanted is access of this useful information from uh, the community, which could be farmers, uh, which could be day-to-day -day gardeners, or anybody who's interested to leverage this information into their day-to-day -day work. So we wanted to provide that user-friendly user interface, uh, which, uh, you know, simple search options, provide some sorting and filtering to navigate them easily to the right information they're looking for. And also, uh, we thought that we should have a back-end service to interact between uh, the front-end and back-end, uh, and also enable uh, some APIs that we can publicly expose it as an open APIs, uh, especially the ones which can share this uh, you know, information. Uh, so we initially started work with crop, but slowly we want to expose uh, some of the other APIs related to different categories of agriculture data. Um, and then finally, we wanted to open, the, open source this solution by deploying at Axta Cloud Infrastructure. So this was the initial requirements we gathered up. And we came up with this uh, uh, you know, high level architecture design where you can see we have a central server which uh, has a user interface, a backend service, and a database. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, we wanted the user interface to help data providers to add data easily. And then we have another side users who could be farmers, day-to-day -day gardeners who can quickly access uh, this information through a user-friendly uh, UI. And also we wanted to provide APIs that could be exposed publicly to programmatically integrate into other uh, applications who want to quickly um, you know, integrate this information or use this information to uh, provide more better recommendations or for their solution work. That was the goal, and some of the benefits, as you can see here, is easy access of this recommendation information, uh, easily uh, programmatically integrated uh, from other third-party integration, and it provides an easy e user interface for both data consumers and providers to share their information and access this information uh, over the browser. Uh, uh, coming into the user interface that we are planning to design, uh, we would like to thank uh, Mojo.net team uh, who are volunteering to contribute in designing and developing the user interface. Uh, and I also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Kendall Kirk uh, from Clemson University who helped us introduce Mojo.net team and uh, contribute to this project in helping and creating this uh, user interface. 
so we are connecting with them. We are currently at the stage of uh, designing the user journeys and also some of the initial wireframes uh, to uh, come up with a user-friendly interface for both data consumers and data providers. Uh, some of the discussions we discussed was we wanted a very responsive uh, user interface that is to support on multiple uh, portable devices or cell phones. Uh, this is because usually uh, farmers uh, walk around in like you know wide fields uh, where they need portable access to you know quickly access this information. Uh, that was one of the reasons we wanted to make it uh, mobile first friendly uh, interface. And uh, we chose React framework over here. Uh, one of the things we we wanted to keep in mind was we wanted to make this project open source. We want to leverage open source technology. We had discussions about other frameworks like Angular, Vue.js, and React. Uh, uh, some of them suggested Flutter, but the whole goal was uh, we wanted the whole community, including the contributors, to easily contribute. So, so that's why we picked a framework that is uh, widely used today in designing uh, user interfaces and you know mobile-first applications and native applications. So we decided to go with React user interface. And finally, we wanted to make this application a progressive web app, package it into progressive web app, because we understood most of the farmers, when they go to their fields in remote regions, they have very less uh, access to the internet or network connectivity over there. So we wanted to enable the offline functionalities. Uh, that's why whenever, uh, when they have network, they wanted to like, you know, download you know, the data sets or useful information and store it in local cache. And then when they have no connectivity, they can go and utilize or see this information. Uh, for the backend service, to align with the front end, we want to stick with the uh, uh, same JavaScript level. So we decided to go with Node.js here and uh, combine with Express so that you know, we can easily spin up some APIs, which uh, comes with ready-made functionalities and packaging from Express. Um, and we also wanted to represent our responses, all the API responses in JSON representation. So uh, we have created a couple of sample data models uh, to bring back the response in JSON representation. As you can see in image, this is one of the response body which will be returned back when you query for a crop information. And we also uh, wanted to uh, create a backend service that way that you know tomorrow if we want to integrate any services uh, along with this uh, backend, it's easy to integrate. Uh, and also if we want to create other uh, services tomorrow to enhance our recommendations for the farmers, we can easily create those services on the backend service. Uh, a couple of APIs which we have created at this initial point based on the sample data that is shared by the Clemson University that is for the crop data are just uh, simple as like, you know, get plants, uh, which will bring a list of all the plants uh, that is stored in the database, uh, get a plant based on an ID, if they're uh, based on the list of plants, if somebody wants to query a specific plant information, then they can query based on it ID, and then it'll bring back uh, uh, an elaborative information about all the plants. And also we want to provide other crude operations uh, for especially the data providers uh, from extension services to easily manipulate the data or change in future because we learn these data sets will change over time uh, with all the climate change happening around, the recommendations will change so they want to go back and change. So we want to provide options such as uh, update and delete if that don't exist and create. And we have one post to add new for data providers to add. And uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight is we wanted to protect all the APIs such as post, update, delete, which is specific to the data, provi data providers. That way, you know, uh, other users will not have access to like, you know, uh, certain information that is uh, pr published by a particular author from an extension service. Uh, for the database, uh, we know we wanted to have a database to store all this recommendation information. Uh, we had uh, big discussions uh, initially, who, which one to pick, whether should we go with a NoSQL database or a SQL database. Uh, I think that debate never ends. Uh, I think it all comes down to a preferential of uh, what is comfortable for individual developers or contributors. And again, uh, I have no personal opinion in either of uh, technologies. It's, it's widely, both NoSQL and SQL uh, databases are widely used today, and both have great open source uh, databases available. Uh, since a lot of uh, our uh, community in participating in this uh, uh, project, we're interested in the relational uh, databases because we also saw 
the uh, crop data structure, which uh, the sample data which was shared by Clemson University had uh, many structure, you know, uh, uh, for example, if you take a metadata level of information, then there is other sub level of information like, you know, uh, where is this crop based off? We, we need to add location information. Then we had to add information such as what are the related diseases that is uh, possible to affect this particular crop. So we wanted to add, and also we wanted to add other information like seeding rates, the irrigation information. So there were so many related information for if you take just a crop as a high level metadata. So that's what we thought, okay, let's go with a relational database. And since Postgres is well known and a widely used database uh, in the open source community, we thought let's go with Postgres over here and we chose Postgres. A couple of other things we had kept in mind uh, was we wanted to normalize the data, although the data we all came with uh, research uh, papers or information in PDF files and HTML contents, we want to extract the key information and normalize it and like store it in a database that way uh, there's no you know, heavy sentence or you know, uh, pages involved. Uh, so that's why as you see, we have, I have a small ERM diagram that I extracted from Postgres to showcase what are the key uh, attributes that we're using over here. Uh, another thing, uh, relational, as I explained, we want to make it relational to uh, uh, come or add more information to a particular uh, meta level information. For example, if you take crop, we wanted to add anything which is related to crop as a separate uh, table or separate schema for that to uh, ex ex expand. And also to provide an option to scalable tomorrow if there's additional information which we have missed. There's, let's say there's another uh, extension service, they think that you know, this particular crop has some other attributes that is relevant to a different location. We can easily add that object uh, as for a different location and then also scale it up to a different you know, model to integrate easily to the uh, existing crop. Uh, and also we want to avoid redundancy, which we think uh, is one of the great challenge today where you know, when we don't have track of the data sets which has been in, uh, you know, accumulated, we lose, you know, we easily uh, start accumulating redundant data, so uh, that's why we want to keep it simple, and so we want to use uh, the relational over here, and finally, to make it open source. Uh, there are a couple of, as we are speaking for the project, uh, our immediate steps right now is currently we're working with uh, Mojo.net team in creating the user-friendly user interface. Uh, they're helping us uh, and working with the Clemson team uh, on the user journey in order to create wireframes. Uh, so they're helping on that. At the same time, we are working with the Clemson team to validate some of the plant information and the sample data that they have shared and if there is possibility to, to add more information. Uh, and also, uh, we're gathering more requirements to enhance our whole uh, application to accommodate more categories of you know, uh, agriculture-related information, apart from crop, which we're currently working on to scale it to and provide more information there. And finally, also, Axtac uh, has other topics of interest uh, where we wanted to in a integrate uh, authentication process, which Axtac is also creating another project called User Registry, for which we want to integrate our project with to enable uh, login authentication and authorization. Uh, as a midterm, uh, we want to uh, test our application, uh, get feedback from different stakeholders that could be uh, any user who is interested to uh, learn about Agrec or use the solution and integrate into their solution. Uh, that way we can work on it and uh, create more robust and uh, you know, enhanced application. Uh, we want to deploy the solution uh, on Axtag Cloud. Uh, we are also thinking about containerizing them and deploying it into a container uh, or Kubernetes environment. Uh, finally, we wanted to add documentation so for external contributors to easily uh, contribute to the project as well as uh, deploy on their systems or you know, regions for their uh, local communities to help access this information. And finally, as a long term, we want to invite other extension services and communities uh, to help us grow and uh, we want to continuously integrate, iterate over the solution and make it improvised and more robust uh, for the farming community and help sharing this information from the Clemson or any other extension services. As I said, we want to welcome a large uh, contribution here. It's not dedicated just for developers, testers on the text level. We want a contribution. We welcome contributions from a, a large community uh, who can help us in to scale this application in as simple as even like, you know, validating the application. 
you know, creating tasks where you can say, hey, some functionality is not working, or somebody looking at our documentation process and telling, hey, some of this information is not working as expected. Can you make a change? Simple as that. And again, we want to welcome anybody who is an expert in agriculture field who can help us validate some of this uh, information or the solution we are creating so that we can always improvise it and make it better for our users. Uh, I'll, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to join us in this effort and take part in this project. Uh, you can uh, go to our Slack. We uh, Axtack has created a Slack. Uh, that is the link which you shared over here. We also have public biweekly meeting on Zoom on every th alternate Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. ET. Uh, uh, and uh, on a Zoom link which I've shared here. Also, we have a public Google Drive where we capture all the initial documentation requirements which we have created for this project and will be posting continuously as a public uh, shareable knowledge for somebody to access and be part of this project contribution. Also, I want to like to take this opportunity to mention that how today open source technology is uh, uh, ubiquitous and accessible for everyone. At the same time, we all know it's uh, also vulnerable for some of the attacks. So that's why I want to highlight that how IBM is taking steps to help improvise this security where we are giving education and knowledge for free for everybody to take part in it and then uh, contribute back to us. So feel free to explore this blog post where you can learn more about uh, the IBM uh, knowledge store of sharing the security aspects on how they're working with OpenSSF to improve the security for the open source uh, uh, industry. Uh, IBM has hosted a Code Cafe. Please feel free to drop by. There's some fun stuff happening over there. Uh, and feel free to pick up some of the cool slags uh, whenever we get a chance. And and thank you, everybody, and open up to questions. Sure, I'll take yours first since you lifted. Yeah, do you provide uh, recommendations on prompts that are uh, not like student tools? So, like uh, text files, um, uh, look screen, or is it all focused on introduction? That's a really good question. I, 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 I'll let you answer some of that, but I do want to repeat it for those who are virtual. Um, I think I heard you say, do we provide or does AgRec provide recommendations on uh, crops that are non-food crops, such, such as textiles? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Uh, like I said, at this moment, we have not uh, tapped into that uh, side of the pro, you know, data sets because uh, we are working from one piece by piece. Uh, like I said, we initially started off with crop. Uh, that's uh, main, one of the main uh, extension knowledge that uh, Clemson is offering. I'm pretty sure there are other similar information, like you mentioned, which we want to scale. So that's why we are designing Agric in such a way that, you know, uh, like you mentioned today, this is a very good feedback that we can take back and work towards provisioning that in our application tomorrow. So we definitely will consider that. Thank you so much. I think we got a new contributor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I think we have time for one more, yeah. one more question. Please. My question is, obviously, some of the farmers aren't necessarily able to access uh, internet resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the question is, how are we thinking about scaling this to more prevalent farmland areas, especially for those that don't have access to internet? How do we scale up? Um, I think you spoke a little bit about yeah, scale. Yeah, so uh, if you see in our uh, user interface, we wanted to package our whole interface as a progressive web application. Uh, the reason for that is to enable this offline functionality. Well, uh, at least we recommend that farmers will go to a region where they have this internet facility to go and quickly download the information that they want on their application level. So the idea is here to uh, locally uh, store it or like you know cache that information for them on for that day. So whenever they go to those remote places where there's no internet activity, they can easily see that information so that they can take activity and. Again, we can always scale this application. We have other call for core projects related to this uh, liquid prep, which measures the soil moisture value in real time. 
and provides recommendation for a farmer to whether to crop their, uh, sorry, what are their crops today or not. Uh, similarly, we have other project called Agrily, which gives them a crop management tool, which uh, studies uh, the weather. Uh, they have created an AI ML model that you know uh, looks back five years old uh, weather history and recommends for this year, for this season, what is the right crop they have to grow, and uh, what are the right weather conditions and what are requirements. So uh, there are other applications which have been designed. Uh, but uh, we are definitely looking to work with them collectively and, you know, uh, make it more uh, extensible. Yeah, and we just have open arms for suggestions on how we can scale because that's such an important aspect of this in the roadmap, how we scale up. So um, certainly open to not only contributions but thought leadership in how we can scale. So I think that's an important question and would love to have even more feedback. And I think that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for listening, for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.